Well, I'd like to welcome everyone back from spring recess uh, for week nine of technical writing, English 2575. Um, one thing I want to make a point of noting right now before we get too far into the video, uh, hopefully I haven't lost anyone yet, um, but it's absolutely important that you watch the lecture completely um, because there's a lot of things I'm going to cover during today's lecture, um, which you know is true for all the lectures that I've uh, delivered so far this semester for you all. Um, but you know, one thing as I'll talk about uh, during today's lecture, um, unfortunately, I think some students may not be giving the due attention to the lectures or uh, listening to them as carefully as needed uh, in order to do the work that's required of everyone in the class um, in order to obviously get the grades that you want. Uh, so I do want to reiterate just before we get started that whenever you watch each week's lecture, which you should always do before you do any work in the class, because everything in this week's class I cover in the lecture, but you need to be in a place where you can be attentive to the lecture, to listen to what I have to say, and most importantly that you have your notebook out to make notes about the things that I talk about, the things that I'm asking you to do. Because just like, as I mentioned in earlier lectures, a large part of technical writing is preparing you just for the simple communication skills that you're going to need in the workplace as someone working in a technical field. Um, and so part of that modeling has to do with attentive listening, uh, paying attention, uh, paying attention to details, to being detail oriented, and of course also making good notes uh, as I said before, like you know, whenever I'm in the workplace, I carry uh, like a pocket notebook that I can put in my shirt pocket or in my pants pocket, and I can pull that out and make notes about anything that I may need to do throughout the day. Uh, whether it be I pass a student in the hallway whenever we're on campus, uh, and they ask me a question that I need to follow up on, or if I see a colleague who needs uh, my help on something, uh, I can make a note in that and remember to do it and of course cross it off once I've done it so I know that that particular task has been completed. Uh, so many of the things that I talk about in our class uh, in order to help you all be successful are just things that I do myself. They're things that I've learned um, you know, by doing in, and not just doing in academia but of course my other past experience and career in information technology. So what do we need to get through today? Now that you have your notebooks out, that you're uh, paying close attention uh, to this week's lecture. Uh, so we're gonna talk about grades uh, and some other things relating to the class. Also about extra credit, I didn't know that here, but I'll tell you about that. Um, we're gonna have some uh, team member changes um, because we've you know, had some students uh, you know, that aren't able to participate for a variety of reasons. And so I've tried to consolidate the teams uh, to make sure that you have a core group of people uh, that can work together on the projects. Uh, we're going to continue with the instruction manual, uh, talk about adding the cover page, I'm going to give you an example of what your uh, instruction manual ought to look like uh, before you share it for peer review, and then we'll introduce the team project, uh, the collaborative team-based project in the class. It's going to take the rest of the semester to complete, so we got plenty of time to do it, uh, but we got to get started right away. And then we'll discuss the homework, which is going to involve peer review on your instruction manual, and then your weekly writing assignment, which is going to be brainstorming for the team project. So you're going to be doing some of the work that's going to fuel your discussions with your team next week. Okay, so it's important to get this, this foundational work done now. All right, so first off, uh, let's talk about grades. And so here I am, I'm on section OL83's uh, course site. The same is true uh, for the OL88 course site. So this is true for both of the classes. Uh, you should see now that there is an extra credit opportunity featured at the top of the page. And this will go down a little bit once I post this week's lecture and weekly writing assignment. Uh, but for this extra credit, very easy. And it's actually uh, not so much focused on technical writing, but simply participating in some of the important events that take place only at City Tech and nowhere else. And so uh, coming up next week is City Tech's 40th annual Literary Arts Festival. Um, this is something that obviously we've been holding for a very long time, 
uh, and it brings together uh, student uh, writers to share their work, student multimedia uh, creators to share their work, uh, as well as uh, music, as well as a uh, literary figure, someone who is a professional in the writing field to share some of their work. And this year we have Stacy Ann Chin uh, who will be joining us for the last part of the program. So how do you get this extra credit? And this and also just to let you know this extra credit can take the place of a weekly writing assignment that you might have missed or I can apply these points to some other assignment like if you've done all the weekly writing assignments if I see that there's an assignment maybe uh, you got like an A minus on, I can use these points to flip that over to an A, for example, uh, or like say a B minus to a B. Uh, so I'll find a way to make it work for you uh, in the best way possible if you take advantage of this. So to get this extra credit, you just need to do two things. First, you need to attend the Literary Arts Festival. It um, takes place next Tuesday evening um, from 5 uh, until roughly about 6.30, 6.45. It will be on Zoom. And in order to get the Zoom link, you need to go to this link that I've given you here at the bottom of the post and register. You just put in your name and email address and then uh, Eventbrite will email you a link to the Literary Arts Festival Zoom webinar. Um, th this is a way we're trying to control how the links go out. So register and then you'll get a link uh, to join us next Tuesday. Now after attending the event, uh, then what you can do is make notes uh, as you're watching the event, like what are the names of some of the students? What are the names of Stacy Ann Chin? Uh, and what are you experiencing from them? Like what did you hear them say? What did you think was most interesting? Was there one uh, uh, performance or talk that was particularly impactful to you. You get to choose what those things are, but write 250 words about your experience at the event, your name dropping some of these people that you hear, and then email that to me uh, at jlsscdtech.cuny.edu. Uh, and then I'll you reply back saying I received it, and we'll uh, add that extra credit to you, uh, to your um, standing in the class. So that's an extra credit opportunity coming up. The other thing that I want to talk about uh, has to do with your grades. So I got caught up with uh, all the grading in the class so far. So project one, the article summary, and project two, the expanded definition project, both of those, of those that I've received, uh, I've graded. And so you can go to our course site, whether it be OL83 or OL88, and over on the left hand side just beneath the navigation menu you'll see this link for check your grade and I give you a grade as well as I give written feedback about your work uh, it's important that if you are unhappy with your grade you read over those comments that I've given you and then you'll want to use those comments to revise your work and then you can email me that work by the end of the semester uh, and then I can read it, compare it to your earlier work. If I see that you took advantage of the comments that I left you, then I will revise your grade. Um, there are some cases where uh, some students may have missed the mark with the assignment, meaning that all the guidelines weren't followed. In those cases, you might see that there is uh, no grade. And I don't want you to freak out about that. Uh, I've reached out to all of you students that that uh, affected, uh, but the main idea is that I want you to go back, read my comments, meet me during office hours so we can discuss the assignment to make sure that you fully understand it, what needs to be done, uh, and then you'll revise your work and then I'll give you a grade on it. Um, but the idea, as I've talked about you, uh, you throughout the semester, with technical writing, a big part of it is not simply that it's about technical subjects. But when we think of the word technical, we tend to think of things like precise, uh, things that are very detail oriented. Uh, I mean, you, you, for example, you imagine like you know, with our like space program, landing on Mars again, 
uh, with uh, the latest rover uh, about to have the first flight on Mars with the remote helicopter drone. Um, these things are all done because things are done precisely. And not just in terms of the way that they're built, but think about all the communication that has to take place behind the scenes for these things to go from initial conception to planning to design to implementation and then further testing and then actual production for the field. And if we think about how all of these different things involve that precise communication, those ideas, that concept of being detail-oriented as being a technical communicator is integral for your success as a technical writing student. Which means that, you know, I think for the most part, the majority of students are listening to lecture, reading the things that I write on our Open Lab site, uh, looking at the syllabus, and then applying those things to doing the assignments. Uh, but in some cases, maybe uh, you aren't listening to the lecture closely enough, maybe you aren't reading the syllabus and the guidelines for the different assignments, in which case you're losing that precision that is absolutely essential, that is required in order to be successful as a technical writer, as a technical communicator. Um, and so it's for these reasons why you know, for some folks either you might have got a grade you might be unhappy with or you might not have received a grade at all yet on your project but you will once you revise your work and follow the guidelines is that this idea of technical writing is that the bar is set very high in terms of actually doing the task that is assigned to you and once you've passed that bar then there's varying degrees of success but you have to cross the bar first in order for there to be even any consideration in terms of the successfulness of uh, the deliverable. Remember that word that I've used before in lecture, the, the deliverable is the thing that you make, um, that it has to cross that bar and then we can start talking about its relative successfulness or not. So make sure that you check your grade, see if there's something that needs to be changed or that you might want to change and then of course you can talk to me during my office hours on Wednesdays from 3 to 5 p.m. or we can make an appointment or we can also just simply talk over email. Uh, again my email address is jellis at cdtech.cuny.edu. Alright so that's grades and we're talking about technical writing expectations and again if anybody has questions about any of this just reach out to me. Um, one thing that I, I have found a little troubling this semester as opposed to previous semesters of teaching online is I've seen remarkably few students this semester during office hours or have had very little email communication with folks. So please take advantage of that because uh, all of this um, you know, back and forth, uh, whether it be on office hours or over email, is for your benefit. And if I can help you, you just need to let me know that you have these questions and I'll help you with them. I want to help you with them. Um, but I need to know whether there's those questions or not. And that's where you come in to reach out to me. All right, so um, before we get into uh, the instruction manual and the team project, uh, the biggest thing that I need to point out to everyone and that you need to pay attention to uh, tomorrow or today rather whenever I send out um, your peer review emails is that your team assignments have uh, had to change. Uh, you know I, when I started the semester I told you you would be working with the same people uh, throughout um, but you know, you know things happen and sometimes we have to you know, shift gears we have to you know, take a new path forward and in this case uh, you, we've had a number of students uh, either drop the class or have had other things come up that has you know, impacted their ability to contribute to the class. Um, and so that's left some teams with very few people that are you know, actively participating. And that's a problem, uh, not just for peer review, but also for the team project. So what I've done and this, is, this applies to both OL83 and OL88, is instead of having four smaller teams, I've now combined the different team assignments into three uh, super teams, larger teams of between five and six members. Uh, and 
this does introduce its own complications, I think, for communication, for contributions from diff different team members. Uh, and that's the challenge of this upcoming assignment, uh, as I'll go over today with the collaborative team project. Um, but one thing I just want to get out in the open first off is even though that you're working with you know, a large group of people on this project, uh, you'll need to leverage different asynchronous technologies. Um, and when I say asynchronous, these are things that we use like for messaging, so we're not actually communicating in real time. Uh, because everybody has different work schedules, uh, different life schedules, and so we're going to have to work around that as much as possible to get the project done. Um, but that being said, uh, this is something that I've had students do successfully before. And just to give you a very extreme example, I've seen students at Georgia Tech um, that have had a group of students in Atlanta and then another group of students in Russia be able to produce very high quality work when they're in totally different geographic areas and have totally different schedules. So this work that you're doing is not impossible, but it does require a different kind of mindset. Uh, and also it's going to require some team members to step up to serve as leaders. Um, and of course, as we move through these projects, if you need help with that, that's something that you can then call on me to try to arrange meetings with the team to help with delegating responsibilities, uh, with um, assigning uh, particular responsibilities, etc. Um, but I have seen students also just simply step up and get things done and coordinate with their team members to do that. Um, so I don't want to be heavy handed and do that with all the teams, but I want you to know that if there's times where that's helpful or needed, reach out to me. And you can do that individually or you can do that as part of a group. So pay attention when I send this reply all email for your instruction manual peer review uh, today because those people in that email will now be your team, not just for peer review on the instruction manual, but that will also be your team for the collaborative team-based project that will close out the semester. So it's important you pay attention to that because you need to look at the names and if you see names you don't recognize, you introduce yourself to them. And then those of you that have been reassigned uh, to a different team, obviously you will recognize that by the names that are on the email. Introduce yourself to your new team because it's absolutely important that you are able to know who one another uh, are and together you'll need to devise you know, your ways of communicating. You can communicate all over email, but I would also highly recommend that you exchange phone numbers, use text messaging, use another means of communication. Uh, I'll list out some um, different um, tools that you might use on the project on this week's lecture post. Things like Slack, Discord, and of course you may already have on your phones like WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, um, any, any you know, social media communication means that you all are comfortable using, please use on the project. I, you, those uh, conversations don't have to include me because uh, I'm not on those social media networks. Uh, that's something that's for the benefit of your team and the success of your team. But I'll talk a little bit more about that in more detail later. Uh, then finally today we'll talk about uh, the homework and the weekly writing assignment. Uh, but first let's talk about your instruction manual. So you can see this week that we need to discuss adding the cover page, uh, getting it published online so that you can share it for peer review as well as you're going to, I'll tell you how to post it to our open lab site next week to actually submit it. But this week we're only doing peer review. So. I will add to this week's uh, lecture post a link to this sample instructions layout document that I made for you all. And basically this is you know, just a Google Doc um, that is set up uh, in a, 
I think, a very straightforward manner for your instruction manual. And what you're missing right now is this cover page for your document. Basically, the, the cover page in the center of the page, and if I zoom out here, I think this will make it a little bit easier for you to see. So here's the full page, and you can see here in the middle that there's the title, in this case, How to Assemble a Skateboard. Beneath that, in smaller type, you will want to have your name. Underneath your name, you'll want to say what your specific major is, uh, such as BTEC in whatever, or Bachelor of Science in whatever. Make sure you include the accurate name of your major in the degree that you're getting. And then on the third line, underneath the title, you'll want to include our school name, New York City College of Technology, comma, space, CUNY. Then on the very bottom two lines of the cover page, you'll want to include information about why you made this. And so I've given you a model here to follow. This user manual was created as a class project in English 2575. Then you'll want to give your section number, and then you'll want to include which semester it was in. In this case, it's spring 2021. Period. Space. Any questions about this project should be addressed to, and then include your name, and then your City Tech email address. Don't put my name there, because I didn't make this. This is something you own. You made this, not just for our class, but as I've, as I've encouraged you for every project in our class so far, you need to be making these for yourself to be able to show off how you are a great communicator, how you know how to do basic technical communication, technical writing things. And this can be a part of your portfolio. You can link this to your LinkedIn.com uh, profile. Uh, you can include this when you apply for jobs. So you own this, and this statement here is a way of you know, showing that to whoever is reading it. Then on the following page, as we've already talked about, you'll have your table of contents. And here I've given the table of contents, and this is not an auto-generated table of contents, as I'm gonna show you all how to do, or I showed you how to do, but I'm gonna remind you of how to do that in a minute. Uh, but this is one where I actually typed it out, uh, where I have 1.0, and then I set off introduction, and then I tabbed over for all the subsequent sections, subsections underneath introduction. Similarly for 2.0, 3.0 list of materials, 4.0 directions, 5 for troubleshooting glossary reference list. And so you can use this as a model uh, to kind of get an idea if like you want to make some changes before you do peer review on your project with your team. Now let me show you uh, briefly before I you know, show you again how to add your own um, table of contents to this thing. Uh, in order to share this for peer review as well as for submitting it in two weeks, you want to publish this to the web. As I mentioned before, I wanted you to use Google Docs for this assignment because one of the great things about Google Docs, besides being able to work collaboratively on your projects with other people, is it has a built-in way of publishing your work to the World Wide Web. So basically you can turn a document that you write into a web page immediately and then share a link with other people and they can find that page without needing a, a Gmail account, without needing special permissions or anything. It makes things foolproof and very simple for sending your work out to other people very quickly and rapidly. So to do that, what you'll want to do is after you've got your, well actually, the other nice thing about, I'll say about you know, publishing your work online, is that any changes you make to your document will automatically be changed on your web page version of the document. So you don't have to like you know, re-upload a file, you don't have to generate a new link. Once you publish this online, you'll be able to make changes and all those changes will be dynamically made to the web version of your document as well. So it's very simple. Um, no extra work is required on your part after you do this. So here I got my document 
I'm ready to send it out to my team members uh, for peer review. You're going to receive that email from me today with your new peer review team. You're going to click reply all so it goes to everybody um, and then you come back to your Google Doc and you want to click on file in the upper left hand corner and then scroll down toward the bottom and you see this option publish to the web. When you do that, you're going to see this screen here, Publish to the Web. And there's this big blue button here for Publish. And so all you got to do is click Publish. It's going to say, are you sure you want to publish uh, this selection? Click OK. And then it's going to give you this link. And you can press Control C or right click on it and copy it. Then go back over to your email, and after you've typed your message to your teammates, like saying, you know, um, you, you, thanks for taking the time to review my work. Uh, there's a link to my instruction manual below. Um, and then, of course, after you, you, you send me your links, I'll review your work as well. So you're making that um, ask and offer. You're asking for help, but you're also offering your help to them. Paste this link in that email and then send it off. Remember, reply all, ask an offer, and then include the link. And then once you've done that, then people will be able to click that link and be able to view your work online without any special permissions. They won't be able to edit it. It's, it's really like a web page that they can just read it uh, through a web browser. Now, what kind of things should you be looking for with your peer review this week? Well, one of the biggest things you should pay attention to is does the person include all of those major sections uh, that I recommended to you all in the model that I gave you for the instruction manual? Uh, there's been a lot of questions I've received from folks about like the equipment list, for example. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that you should be thinking about your ideal reader for your instruction manual. They may not understand or realize what you're really asking them uh, to use or do in your instruction manual because they don't have all the information that you've got. They don't have that expertise that you have. And so you really want to make things as simple as possible and break things down as much as possible. Uh, when you're talking about things. So one of the biggest things for like many folks I think are doing instruction manuals for computer related things. One of the main things you want to include in your equipment list, do they need a computer? Is there a specific type of computer that they need? Is it a Mac or a PC? Can they do this with a desktop computer or a laptop or both? Uh, if they're using a desktop, well not only do they need a tower, but they need a monitor, they need a keyboard, they need a mouse, maybe they need an internet connection. And then, of course, what software do they need? You need to say what that is. Uh, does it need to be installed? Like, you don't have to show them how to install it if that's not part of your instruction manual, but you may need to make a note, X software needs to be installed before following these instructions. It may sound like you're know, self-evident. It may sound like common sense. But in an instruction manual, you want to break things down for like someone that may not know anything about what it is you're talking about. You want to make it so that they can, someone that has very little of the same expertise that you have is able to get up to speed and accomplish the task that you're helping them uh, perform through your instruction manual. Um, so that's the main thing is like looking at the different categories but also and this is probably the most important thing that you can help, help someone with their instruction manual is read through the directions, the direction section. As you're reading through the direction section, do you have questions for the writer of that instruction manual? Does something not make sense? Does it seem like maybe the steps are out of order? Or is there a step that's maybe skipped that should be explained better? So anything that you see as you're reading through those directions, and I, I'm, you need to read through those directions carefully, okay? Read them aloud. That'll slow you down so that you actually spend some time thinking about these directions that you're giving peer review feedback for. 
to make sure that you give that person some information based on your experience going through the directions to say whether this all makes sense or if there's something missing that needs to be added. Like you don't necessarily have to know what that is, but I think as you read through the directions, you're gonna get a good sense of whether there's something missing or not. And in which case you can say between step, you know, for example, between step three and four, it seems like there's something that should go there. Like I, I didn't see how you went from step three to four. Can you expand on that or you know, add another step there? Um, that's all you gotta do. Like you, your job is not to fix the problem for them. Your job in peer review is to help them see where there might be problems that they then have to solve. Um, and then of course, if there's any kinds of references, if they're citing material, again, make sure that everything you're doing in the class is in APA format. This is on the syllabus. This is something I've lectured on before, uh, but everything that involves uh, quotations um, need to be cited. Uh, I've, I've you know, discouraged you from doing any paraphrasing. I want to see actual quotations that you then describe in your own words, that you contextualize in your own words, but that quoted material needs to have, be followed by a parenthetical citation, author, date, page, or paragraph number, and then in the reference list at the end, you need to have a bibliographic entry in APA format. And as I've said before, there's a great guide online about using APA. Just go to Google type in Purdue, P-U-R-D-U-E, OWL, O-W-L, A-P-A, and hit enter. The very first link is gonna take you to the Purdue OWL website. That's the Purdue um, University's online writing lab. And they've been updating this information for years now. And it's got all the great information that you need so you don't have to buy like an APA guide or anything like that. This information's online, we can access it for free very high quality, vetted by me uh, over years of use, both as a student and as a professor. Uh, so we can rely on them for learning how to do APA format. In your previous writing classes, you should have already learned, like say MLA, uh, in like a English 1101 or 1121 class. APA is just a different format. All the information is pretty much the same. Your author's names, titles of work, uh, journals or um, book titles, um, years, volumes, issues, page numbers, um, DOI links, uh, document and identifier numbers, all these types of things uh, are, are pretty universal, but the order that we might put them in uh, with some variation is different. And so you should have had experience using a professional style before. Now you need to learn how to adapt what you've already learned to this new style. That's important. That self-motivated learning that I'm asking you to do, that you're called on to do, uh, because when you're in the workplace, you may be working for a company that has its own house style in which they say, this is the way that we're expecting you to document all of your work. Uh, whenever you write something that may be a part of a copy that goes on a website or in a brochure or an instruction manual, and you have to follow their style, or they may want you to use another style like IEEE style which is a little different again, but it uses all the same parts. They're just mixed up in different ways. Um, so it's important that, you, that, again, you're learning this attention to detail, and that's something that you is called on for you to do on your own. I provide you the tools, the places to go. We talk about them you know, in, in some you know, general and some specific ways in previous lectures, but then you have to take it from there as a self-motivated learner to then apply it more broadly on these different projects. As, you know, as being you know, curiosity-minded uh, technologists, technology enthusiasts, this sh should be you know, part of your wheelhouse. Uh, and if it's something maybe you're having to get more used to, I would encourage you to make this a part of your wheelhouse to be a lifelong learner this way. Um, because I mean, the reality, as I mentioned before when I talked very briefly about the um, uh, job search help website that I had linked to on our site that I made available for all City Tech students is that if you're not a lifelong learner, if you're not someone who is motivated to learn on their own, um, to take advantage of opportunities to expand your skill set, that your long-term employability is going to be limited. 
I mean, it's just the reality of the situation. In most cases, people going to technology fields are not going to be working at the same company for 40 years like uh, our folks or our grandparents might have done before us. That you know, we're going to be changing um, employment you know, for a variety of reasons, whether we want to find better opportunities for ourselves, whether we get laid off and have to be ready to find a new job quickly. Uh, these are just the reality of the world right now. But the way to better prepare ourselves is by being lifelong learners so that we have skills that we can demonstrate that we're always on top of our field and maybe also looking to tangential or parallel fields uh, that we might be able to transition into. So again, this class, this kind of work that you're doing on all these different projects should be setting up heuristics. Heuristics is a word that means shortcuts. Uh, that means ways of doing things very quickly. And so even though we do specific things, you should be generalizing some of these things into how you can apply them to other areas of your life, whether it be you professionally or, or in your personal life, um, where we use these tricks uh, for like doing research, for documenting that work, for summarizing work, for creating instructions, for uh, doing expanded definitions. These can be transitioned into a lot of different things that we do on a day-to-day -day ba basis as professionals. So uh, again, publish your work uh, from your Google Doc for your instruction manual. File, publish to web, copy that link. Um, put that into the email when you reply all and then watch for other people's instruction manuals to come around and give one another feedback on that. You look at the overall structure, comment on that, look very carefully at the directions, read through those slowly and carefully, and identify where there might be places that information is skipped or something needs to be added, etc. And then next week, I'll talk about uh, how to pub, you know, how to submit your um, published document uh, to our open lab site. So that'll be next week. All right, so that's everything with the instruction manual. And I'll give you that link to this model. Oh, one last thing I wanted to show you, uh, which is your um, just a reminder about how to generate your own table of contents and also how to work with your document as it is. So in a previous lecture, I showed you how in Google Docs, you want to select the headings that you have created throughout your document and change them to a heading number. So normally when you're writing, it's going to be set as normal text. You see this right here, normal text. And for each of your headings, you want to change those to heading one for your main headings, like the things that are like 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. And then anything underneath those would be heading two, heading three, heading four, etc. So for right now, I'm going to change that back for the introduction. 1.0, that's heading one. Purpose is heading two. You see heading two here. This intended audience I made as a subheading of purpose because audience is related to purpose of the document. So this is actually heading three. See heading three here. Now after I've gone through my document and set everything as heading two, heading two, heading two, heading two, heading two, heading two Heading one, see 2.0, that would be a top level heading, so that's heading one. After I've done that, at the top of my document, I'm just going to get rid of the one I have here now. Okay. Normal text. All right. So here I am at the top of my document. I don't have a table of contents yet. So first off, what I need to do is set apart my document from everything else. So like here beneath here, this is like all of my writing in my document. And then here's just some blank space at the top of the first page. 
Well, I need to have one page for my title page. I need one page for my table of contents. And then the third page would be where my instructions actually begin. So to do that, put your cursor at the very top of your document, the very first line. If there isn't a blank line there, just hit enter a few times and then go back up to the top so that you're at the very st start of your document. And then you'll want to go up to your menu in Google Docs and choose insert and then go down to break and insert a page break. Insert a page break. Okay, so now we have one full blank page at the beginning and now we're on the second page where we have the beginning of the instructions. Well, we need one more page for our table of contents. So again, I'm going to go to insert, break, and then page break. And so now we can see I have one page for my title page, I have one page for my table of contents, and then on the third page I have the beginning of my document. Okay. Now for that title page you can look at the sample document that I gave you a link to. Here's the title page on that and you can use this as a model. Uh, in large type in the very center of the page put the title of your instruction manual. How to whatever it is you're teaching someone how to do. Your name, your major, and then the name of our institution, New York City College of Technology, comma, CUNY. Excuse me, then you'll want to uh, press return to go to the bottom of the page, excuse me, and add that sentence, this user manual was created as a class project in, you tell you know, what our class is and the semester. Any questions about this project should be addressed to, give your name and your City Tech email address. After you've done that, click on to the second page. And what you'll find is the second page will not have been influenced at all by what you've done on the first page. That's the reason why we're using page breaks. Page breaks div, uh, separate the pages so that you can put things on one page and that anything you put on that preceding page will not affect the layout of the subsequent pages. This is a useful tool that you can use not only in Google Docs, but also uh, in Microsoft Word and Apple Pages and LibreOffice as a way to create professional looking documents. Ha using like your return or enter on your keyboard to add a lot, a lot of um, line breaks throughout is a very poor way to format your document because any changes you make somewhere else can throw off your layout later on in the document. You don't want that. So you got your title page and now I've clicked on to the second blank page which will be for my table of contents. Well if you've added headers as I've shown in the previous lecture and just kind of went over very briefly now in the rest of your document you're ready to rock and roll. Because all you got to do is click at the top of your second page, get your cursor there, and then you want to click insert again and then scroll down to table of contents and then I would suggest choosing with blue links because that'll make the document clickable because we're publishing it online so someone just click a link and it'll take them to that part of your document so with blue links is what we want to insert and you can see automatically all of my headings like Google Docs basically dove into my document said oh there's heading one, heading two, heading three, all throughout and created this table of contents automatically for me. I don't have to do anything else. I'm ready to go. So this is make, makes the table of contents creation very easy if you do the work earlier of creating headings as I showed before. All right, so we got our table of contents and then after that you're ready to click on file. Uh, then you publish to the web and get that link. Now one thing uh, that I'll also mention about the table of contents, if you go back later and make some changes to your document, 
you uh, that may change your uh, organization, your headings, you'll want to come back to the table of contents and you see this refresh link right here off to the side. If you don't see that, click into your table of contents anywhere and it'll show this over on the left. And all you do is click that and you can see that it gives the pop-up um, um, guide there, update table of contents. And so any changes you make to your headings below in your document, after you click that refresh link, it'll automatically refresh your table of contents for you. Easy as that. Um, you know, and, and again, like with these lectures, where I'm showing you how to do things you know, uh, through this video lecture, if you need to pause, go back, watch this part again, or have this open in a separate window or on your phone while you're working on your computer so that you can go through it step by step. Because uh, I don't want anyone to, to miss some of these things. Um, and of course, beyond what I show you how to do, Google is your friend. If you have questions about uh, these things that either you want to answer on your own or you don't want to wait for my response because you know I may not be able to respond immediately to your email, also go to Google and to ask your question there. You'll likely find some help uh, from some website, whether it be through Google or uh, another page where people are asking the same questions about how to create a table of contents in Google Docs, how to publish it to the web, all these types of things. So use that as a resource as well. All right, so we've gone over the instruction manual, so now we need to talk about the team project. And so what I'm gonna do during today's class is go over what the project involves overall for your weekly writing assignment, you're going to do the brainstorming to come up with some ideas that your team can choose from for the project. Uh, but it won't be until next week that we actually begin working on the project um, a as a class, uh, where I'll start talking about one specific part of the team project, which will be the research report, which is like the anchor for the project, the biggest part of the project. But we'll save that for next week. So this week is just giving you an idea of what's involving. You're going to remember that the peer review email that I send out today has all of your new team members. Some of them you, you will recognize, uh, but some of them uh, may be new folks to you, in which case you need to introduce yourself and you as a team have to decide what's the best way to communicate with one another. Um, and again, someone in the team needs to step up to help coordinate. Uh, if you have trouble you know, finding that person or you know, not one person does want to step up to take that responsibility, make sure you reach out to me uh, by email so that I can set up a meeting with the team and we will figure that out together. Not a problem, uh, it does happen. Uh, but also, if you can get someone that will step up to help coordinate things, not necessarily be a dictator, but someone who's going to help coordinate things, then please take on that responsibility, take on that role, because in the workplace, you're going to be called on to do that anyways. Uh, it won't always be a matter of, you know, one person being said, okay, this is you know, your team leader. It may be up to the team to decide amongst themselves who that will be, and that's what you're going to need to do in this case um, for the project. All right, so what is the collaborative team-based project? So this is going to be this week's lecture post uh, whenever I post it to the site uh, Wednesday. Um, but I'm going to have it open it to go over the different parts with you. So the team-based project diagrammatically, meaning as a picture, looks like this. So if we start here, this box here says think. What is a problem in need of a solution? You need to identify what is the problem. What is the problem's background? Like, how did it come to be? What are ways people have tried to fix the problem before? Um, and then, of course, what are some possible solutions? 
Well, the problem that you as a team are going to be trying to identify and then research needs to be a technical or scientific problem. So again, because this project should be useful to you all as technologists, as people that are working in the computer fields, in the networking field, in electrical engineering, you need to choose something that's related in some way um, to your major and your future careers. Okay, You don't want to choose something that is irrelevant to what it is that you are all studying. I know right now, like many of you may immediately think the, uh, a problem might be like, say, like if we want to talk about like a big problem, would be the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, for you all, not being, you know, epidemiologists in training or, um, you know, viral um, researchers, I mean, it, that is irrelevant. But you can see inside of that problem some technical problems. You might find technical problems relating to um, being able to report uh, infection rates, vaccination rates, uh, how to present that information online, like say through a web portal or on a map. These are all technical problems that are involving computers, networking, etc. that you might be able to dive into as a technical problem within that larger problem of the COVID-19 pandemic. So make sure whatever that problem is you choose is one that is relevant to what it is you study and what it is you plan to do when you graduate from City Tech. It has to be a technical or scientific problem relating to what it is you are doing. Now, once you've identified that problem, you're going to be researching it. And much of the research like skills that you've already developed in your previous English classes and that you've done on our earlier projects on the article summary project and the expanded definition project will feed into a report. And this will be a technical report, one in which you identify a problem and you are presenting as a, as a set of solutions, um, possible solutions you find in your research. The purpose of this report is not for you to solve this problem, okay? I'm not expecting you to. But what you will be doing is researching possible solutions to the problem that you've identified and then reporting on them in this document that you're going to create. Now, with that report, which again, that's the biggest part of the assignment, that's the most important part of this assignment, okay? That report is going to feed into a website that you built. Uh, and I'm gonna show you how to do that using OpenLab. So again, you're gonna get more experience using WordPress because again, WordPress is the underlying technology of OpenLab that you can put on a resume. You can't put on your resume that you built something on OpenLab. People will wonder what the hell you're talking about. But what you will be able to say is that you've done content creation and you built a simple website using WordPress after working on this project. And that website is going to include your research report and it's also going to include this presentation that you're going to create together. And so later in the semester, what we'll do is we'll talk about how you can use, uh, like say Zoom, for example, as a way of creating an online presentation that you can upload to like say Vimeo or YouTube. And it'll be something you can embed inside your website just like I embed our weekly lectures. And so I'll talk you through uh, the basics of how you would want to get that done so that everybody can contribute to that presentation even though we are not all uh, you know, together uh, in the classroom where you would normally give this required presentation on the project. And you see here I note, all components should support each other, cohesive, interconnected, Synergistic. Synergistic means that things um, work together and make themselves stronger than they were alone. That by working together, they produce something much more powerful. And that's the idea behind the report, the website, and the presentation. Now, 
these parts, the report, website, and presentation, you do together. Okay, these, this is your grade on these uh, depends largely on what you produce together, but your individual grades you receive on these are going to be influenced as well by this reflection report that each of you will produce independently of one another. Because the thing about the team dynamic is that I can't be everywhere omniscient watching all of your teams work on this project. I mean, that's just a reality, right? So the individual reflection reports are a way for you to report on your contributions to the project as well as reporting on what you observe of others contributing to the project. Now, I don't want you to worry that someone may say something that is untrue about you in these individual reflection reports that would reflect poorly on your final grade. If only one person, if you for whatever reason that might have a beef with you, says something you know, um, you know, derogatory about your involvement in the project, that alone won't be enough to affect your grade. But if all of your team members were to report the same kind of thing, then that would be something I would have to consider in terms of like your involvement in the project. And if there are serious concerns, I will be reaching out to the involved students to find out more about what's going on. So I don't want anyone to fear these. This is a way of being honest, both in terms of what you contribute as well as what others contribute. Uh, to the process. And this is, again, getting you ready for uh, workplace um, practices where you will have you know, um, periodical um, reviews by your immediate supervisor, by managers, by executives, and each of them are going to have access to different information about your um, performance in the workplace. Some of it is going to be from uh, feedback they receive by your, from your coworkers. Some of it may be automated that they're able to uh, gain uh, from the software that you use in the workplace uh, for your uh, different projects. There's a lot of different ways that they have access to the same kind of information that I'm asking you to supply with your reflection reports. Um, so it's good practice I think both in terms of you're being able to report about what you and others do honestly, but it's also good practice for you to be aware that this is a reality of the workplace that you need to be prepared for, um, both in terms of documenting the work that you do, as well as uh, being open to the, these criticisms that you will receive uh, from those you work with, either as peers, meaning that they're on the same level as you, as well as those who are above you in, in supervisory positions. Uh, but a big part of that, uh, these reflection reports, uh, I'll tell you about in just a second. So let's, let's work through the other parts uh, and then I'll get back around to what, how this is gonna help you in the workplace with your reflection reports. So, uh, this is taken from the syllabus. These are the different parts of the project and in terms of you know, what is the requirements for each of these parts of the project. So again, the biggest part of the collaborative team-based project is the 4,000 to 6,000 word analytical research report. That's 15% of your final grade. Uh, each team member contributes 1,000 to 1,500 words to the overall 4,000 to 6,000 word analytical research report on a scientific or technological problem. And remember that scientific or technological problem needs to be something relating to what you're studying and what your, uh, your career goals are. And you all as a team will decide on what that problem will be. And the, this week's weekly writing assignment will generate some options that you will choose from. So this report needs to demonstrate these things. First, knowledge of the history and context of the problem. So you gotta be able to show like what is the background on that problem? 
You know, it didn't just come out of like thin air. There had to have been some lead up to it. And so you'll want to do research to find out what that history is, how it relates to other things, okay? Second, knowledge of the causes and nature of the problem. So like you have to look at what causes the problem to be and you also need to be able to talk about the nature of the problem. Like what does it relate to? Um, what you know, is the, uh, does it affect you know, certain groups and not others? Is it something relevant that a lot of people should be aware of? What is that nature of the problem? Third, ideas for solving the problem. So this is where you come up with some solutions to the problem. And again, you're not actually implementing these solutions. These ideas for solving the problem might be things you come up with on your own, but it, if you want to make a stronger case for these solutions, you should find other people that provide research uh, that lead the way that you can use as supporting evidence, right? That makes your argument stronger. And again, there is an argument to be made in a technical report. And that is that you're, you're providing you uh, your accurate information about the background, but you're also providing uh, supported evidence uh, for the solutions that you're suggesting. If there isn't that research there, why would anyone believe that you have the right idea if you haven't researched it, if you haven't shown how others have you know, done some of the basic research uh, that you can report uh, as a way of supporting your overall argument? Uh, fourth, uh, the ability to explain the problem and offer possible solutions to a general audience. Uh, and this is where you're going to be you know, taking this technical report and being able to uh, break it down in different ways for these different audiences. Uh, five, the ability to integrate written work with the written work of a partner or partners in a coherent report. And this is the collaborative nature that I'm gonna go over next week. And we'll be using Google Docs to help us with this. And then six, knowledge of proper research report format. And we'll be looking at David McMurray's technical writing textbook online, which you already have a link to, we've talked about before, uh, who offers uh, advice and models for how this should look. Also, the document should have at least six library sourced citations, um, you know, things that you are quoting from and providing parenthetical citations and references at the end of your document. And of course, any outside sources should be documented according to APA format. Now you can have other sources in your document from websites, from business websites, uh, from anywhere online, uh, but they need to be contextualized like you don't want to just take some quote from some rando website if you don't know who actually wrote that information. You need to find out who wrote that information. Are they believable? Are they trustworthy? And explain that. Um, but after these six library sourced uh, sources, you can also go to other places, but you need to contextualize them. So after you, you've been, or after this research report is, is being finalized, you need to then turn to the other two parts of the, the collaborative part, which is going to be the seven to 10 minute oral analytical research report and the website. So with the um, oral report, this is where you're going to be using um, Zoom or another video collaboration tool, you can use Google Hangouts would also be an option, um, to record you as a team. All team members have to speak if you, the team member wants to get credit on this part of the assignment. Uh, but each team member will have a part of a script that you've written together that you know, presents your report uh, through an oral presentation meaning a spoken presentation that also includes a visual component uh, using like say Google Slides with Google Docs uh, and Google Drive uh, or um, Microsoft PowerPoint uh, or Apple. Um, I haven't used it in so long. Um, Apple's implementation of you know, a slide deck for presentations uh, name escapes me right now. 
but any of these would be fair game to use so that there's a visual component just like you know I have this visual component anchoring my presentations in our class you would use something similar for your video recorded oral presentation that you then create a video from and that video will then be embedded in your website okay so what is this oral report need to include basically it is a distillation if you're familiar with that term from your chemistry classes where like you want to get rid of all the parts you don't need so all you have left is the important parts right so it distills your much longer research report into something very small um, you know, a good rule of thumb is that for every one page double spaced of writing is about two and a half minutes of speaking time. So for you know a seven to ten minute presentation, you're only looking at like you know three to four pages, probably maximum, right? Uh, so it's not a lot of writing, and the writing is actually already done with your report. What you need to do is consolidate it, leave you just focus on the important parts add some transitional language like introducing the different speakers and what you're about to talk about and that's it so the oral presentation doesn't have to be overly complicated but it does involve some important cognitive work about how to take something much bigger that big report and then breaking it down into just the important parts for your oral presentation so here the uh, this is 10 percent of your final grade the goal of this part of the project is to trans transform your written report into a spoken presentation anchored by a PowerPoint or other visual presentation supplement. As a team, adapt and present your analytical research report as an oral presentation that demonstrates first, knowledge of oral presentation techniques and conventions, which we'll talk about. Two, the ability to organize a presentation effectively. Uh, three, the ability to incorporate various media into the presentation, including appropriate computer software, just meaning that you're using the tools accurately. Uh, four, awareness of audience. This is going to be for a general audience. Five, the ability to communicate the value of the product or service in clear spoken English. In this product or service, are, these are the solutions that you're coming up with. Six, the ability to answer audience questions. Um, and this is something that we'll have to um, accommodate in different ways using the website uh, that you're putting this 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 work on. So don't I don't want you to stress about that. Seven, the ability to incorporate uh, collaborate productively with a partner or partners. That means working online together. And eight, the ability to explain the problem and offer possible solutions to a general audience, which you're going to do. Okay. And finally, uh, we get to the website. And again, a website advertising a product or service responding to the analytical research report. We're, we're turning this a little bit in our project so that the website is going to be a way of reporting out your report. So you're gonna have a link to that full report. You're gonna have embedded the video of your oral presentation, and then just a breakdown of the basics of the background of the problem and then some of those solutions that you find in your um, research okay and so here um, the goal of this part of the collaborative project is to imagine a service or product that your team can offer that is related to your research report and oral presentation and this offering is only the solutions that you've done in your research okay you're not actually going to be doing these things um, both of which will be featured on the website in some way the website should demonstrate one, knowledge of the product or service offered, meaning the solutions of pertinent market forces and of the potential customer base. Um, these will be things that you incorporate as a part of what these solutions involve. Will these be solutions that government implements? Are these solutions uh, that uh, companies, corporations implement? Are these things that individuals need to do? You get to identify that. And this all goes back to your research report. You do this work in the research report and then it filters down into your presentation and then into the website. So don't think of the presentation and the website as being any heavy lifting. The heavy lifting will already have been done in your research report and then it filters down into these 
subsequent parts of the project. Um, basic knowledge of web page design and composition. We're going to be using WordPress. We're going to be using OpenLab. Uh, the website will be based on your presentation and is encouraged to be integrated in your presentation, which you, it, actually we're flipping that because this language comes from whenever I have students meet in person. We're going to be integrating your presentation into the website instead. Uh, and then all graphics, logos, design, and text must be created by your team. Okay, that's something I can't stress enough. All of the images that you use um, except for like screenshots of software if you're talking about how to use a particular software or how to use a website or something have to be made by you. Uh, that means that everything that goes into this just like your instruction manual I'm not grading as an art project alright but I do want everything that you make to be intentional that you make the choices that you decide how things ought to look. For example going back to the instruction uh, manual that you're working on now. This model that I made for you all, you see like this, these drawings of like the skateboard, the trucks, the wheels. I did all that just using uh, the drawing uh, tool built into Google Docs. So you know, this is, and I'm not like you know, a graphic designer, I'm not an artist. I mean you look at it and you, you probably say that it looks like crap, but that's fine. I chose how I wanted to lay this out, like it as an exploded diagram of the different parts that would be going into building the skateboard. And so for you, you want to use these same tools or better tools that you may have access to or even just you know, pen and paper uh, to draw and then to take a picture of those things to integrate into your website, integrate into your report, etc. They have to be made by you and your team. Then finally, the last part of the team project is going to be this individual 250 to 500 word reflection on collaboration. And this document, basically you need to report on what you did, what you contributed, and what others contributed. And so this is where I wanted to mention that this is good practice for you to get into for when you're in the workplace. What I mean by that is when you are in the workplace, you want to keep very detailed notes separately like in a notebook or on your own personal computer separate from anything that is owned by your workplace to keep track of all of the work that you do uh, so like if you contribute to a project you need to have not just a record of the things that you've done but examples of the work that you did uh, if you sent like some writing to go into a uh, like say a report or a website keep copies of all that for yourself so that if you go into a say a periodical review like a like a, a quarterly review or an annual review and let's say your your manager says well I see um, that you your team worked on this project but I don't have any record that you helped on that well you can just say ah not a problem I have that right here and you can just bring out your laptop or bring out your notebook and give your manager like here's like where I sent these emails here's the writing that I did here is like this project design that I did so that in case someone like either forgets or maliciously just doesn't say that you helped on a project you are protecting yourself so that whenever you go into those reviews you're going to be able to show off what you can do and so this is a way of getting in that practice of you know, keeping documentation of what you do and then being able to report on it through some writing directly to me. This will be a document none of your team members see. Only I will see it. It helps me determine what everybody contributes to the overall project, but it's also useful to you to get in this practice of documenting the work that you do and the work that you observe others do on a collaborative project that you're a part of. And so again, you know, the main part of the project is the research report, which we're going to talk about in more detail next week. It's going to be using a lot of the different types of work that you've already done in our class, such as summarization, defining terms, using proper citation formats. So I mean, you're going to be reusing a lot of these things you've already practiced in our class. 
Each team member should keep a log in their notebook about the work that you do. Again, that's going to go into that uh, individual reflection report at the end of the project. And then um, think of each of the following um, parts as going into this interconnected larger project. And as a part of that, you, you may see as things develop, there may be certain team members that can help in specific ways so that you can delegate certain responsibilities to them while other people work on other parts. For example, um, with the analytical research report, all team members have to contribute writing. Okay, that, that goes without saying. But when we get to like say the website and the presentation, the oral presentation, there may be you know, parts where you say, well, this person's really good with video stuff. Why don't you take the lead on putting together our presentation? And another person may be good at working, may already have experience with WordPress, and they can be in charge of designing the website. And then other people can then contribute in smaller ways to those parts of the project. So delegation, um, you know, owning responsibility, these are keys to the project success. And as you go through this project, if you need help with setting that up, if you need help with someone taking the lead, you know, I can designate someone. That's not a big deal. I can pick you know, amongst all the team members and say, okay, you're taking the lead on this. But I think it's more valuable to you all if uh, one or a couple people in the team can step up to these roles on your own uh, without needing me to, to designate that uh, and make someone do something that, that for whatever reason, maybe they didn't want to step up to. But if that needs to take place, I will do that. All you got to do is reach out to me by email and I'll make that happen. So that's the project overall. So what are we going to be doing to get that started this week? So you're going to know who you're working with by the email I send out today for peer review on the instruction manual. That's your new team. Okay. Um, you again likely recognize some names but you may be on a team with folks that you don't recognize names and that's fine too make sure you introduce yourself and other people pay attention to who's in that email so if you see a name you don't recognize you know, reach out and say hey you know I see you're a new a new, new member of our team tell us about yourself I'm and then let them know who you are because again we're having to use digital media like email and other messaging platforms in the way that we used to be able to do this very easily by like shaking hands in class and saying hey I'm so and so and you start a conversation it's a little harder it's more difficult now but that doesn't mean that we can't do it so to get things started though we're going to be doing something individually and then this individual thing you do this week for the weekly writing assignment will go into the beginning of your discussions for the analytical research report next week. Okay, so it's important to do this weekly writing assignment individually this week in preparation for the work you're going to be doing next week. Now, in addition to that, when you're emailing back and forth for peer review on the instruction manual and introducing one another uh, for folks, for teams that have new members, make sure that you are also beginning to coordinate about how to stay in touch besides using email for the project. You're welcome to use email, but I would suggest you have another way of getting in touch with one another, whether it be uh, by text messaging with your phones, using um, uh, um, some sort of messaging platform like WhatsApp or Slack or Discord. Um, you need to have another channel for communication. Uh, and then we'll layer on top of that other ways like using uh, Google Drive and Google Docs, which we'll talk about next week for um, the collaborative writing you're going to be doing on the project. So getting that weekly writing assignment. For this week's weekly writing assignment, uh, I would like you to brainstorm some possible scientific or technical problems that you can discuss with your team. Specifically, I would like you to focus on scientific or technical problems relating to your major uh, and career goals. All this I've said before, but just to reiterate that. Uh, perhaps it will involve problems relating to computing hardware or software, networking, electrical engineering challenges, 
uh, applications of computing and networking to other real-world problems, that's fine. And I give some examples here, uh, such as smart power grids, which you know, even though that's involving like electrical energy distribution, all that involves computers and networks in order to monitor and then reallocate power. So that's you know a computer problem, computer and networking problem. Driverless cars. I mean, this is involving like you know electrical engineering with sensors. It's involving computers for using all that sensor information and, and algorithms and software to make sense of all that sense information that's coming in. Uh, Bitcoin energy use is a big deal right now. Because um, I mean, you know, I mean, separating the 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 economic theory behind Bitcoin, the reality is that Bitcoin uh, is using a tremendous amount of energy to do very little practical work other than maintaining you know, that particular blockchain. And as a result, that that's a real problem. So, like, are there ways to address this uh, and try to re you know reduce that energy footprint? You know, with some sort of techno technological or scientific solution. So these are just a few ideas amongst many, many that are out there. So again, you want to brainstorm some ideas. And to do that, uh, for the weekly writing assignment, I want each person to write at least 250 words in a memo format addressed to Professor Ellis with the subject Team Project Brainstorming. And I want you to discuss in your memo three possible technical or scientific problems relating in some way to your major and career goals. For each problem, clearly state what the problem is in your own words, who or what industry it might affect. Does it like in, affect individuals or does it affect countries? Does it involve uh, an industry? Uh, any of those things. And then uh, list out you know, or write some of your own thoughts about how the problem might be solvable. Like what just off the top of your head, what might be done to fix this problem? So do that for three different technical or scientific problems. Excuse me, adding up to 250 words or more. After you've written this memo someplace safe, copy and paste it into a comment on this blog post. And this is important and circulate it that and circulate it via email reply all to the email that I send to each team for peer review and make a note of that each team Because again, that email has your new team members listed in it. Now I want everybody to watch for that. I, you know, hopefully I didn't make any mistakes with my reassignment of folks, but if you don't receive this peer review email this week for the instruction manual, obviously you should check your junk mail folder just to make sure it didn't go there accidentally. But if you don't see it anywhere, reach out to me so that I can figure out if maybe I inadvertently left you off you know, one of the email lists uh, or if something else happened. So you have to do your due diligence because I've you know, said it at least a dozen times in this, this uh, lecture today about that peer review email I'm sending today. So if you don't receive that, make sure you let me know so that I can follow up and make sure that you're assigned to a team and to let that team um, know who you are. Um, and so as a part of this reorganizing, instead of having four teams per class, uh, it's now down to three teams per class. Um, so there, the teams have a little bit larger numbers than we had when we started the semester uh, in some cases, um, but um, I think that we can still make this manageable. Um, but again, it's going to require coordination on everybody's part uh, to use email and some other means of communicating to, to get all this work done. And I might help you through that, give you some ideas for that, but it's ultimately up to each team to implement that. That's part of the challenge of this project, just the same as if we were in person in, in school, is that you, you would, it would be up to each team to figure out how to make uh, this collaboration happen beyond what basic tools I'm going to show you how to use in the class. If you have questions about any of this stuff, make sure you remember to email me, jellis at citytech.edu.
um, .cuny.edu. Uh, remember, oh, actually, this is incorrect about virtual office hours. Uh, this week I'll have office hours, uh, so ignore this that's on the screen right now. I forgot to update that. Uh, my office hours will be Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. The link is over on our syllabus. Um, so all I got to do is click that, and that'll take you there. I've already you um, reached out to some folks that are going to be coming to office hours. If you come to office hours and I'm already talking to someone, I may ask you just to step off for a second and come back like five minutes, ten minutes, uh, so that I can just focus on the one student uh, on on what we need to talk about, and then I'll you know, come back to talk with you about what you have going on. Um, so we'll we can coordinate that. It's not a big deal. Uh, and then, of course, if you can't come during my office hours on Wednesdays, 3 to 5 p.m., send me an email letting me know your availability for the next few days, and then we'll set up a time when we can meet outside of my normal office hours. That's not a problem. Uh, so, you know, remember, we're almost, you know, we're on the, the downhill slope of the semester now. Uh, we do have a lot of work still to do, but at least you know, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel for this semester. It's coming up, it's going to come very quickly, but we still have plenty of time to get this work done if uh, you're able to collaborate and work together uh, using different means of communication to, to coordinate and collaborate together. Uh, so, I, I again, beseech you, make sure you include me uh, uh, in your thinking about questions and reaching out if you have any problems and uh, we'll continue with this project next week but this week again it's peer review on the instruction manual um, you sharing your weekly writing assignments with your team members so that next week we can actually hit the ground running with your um, deliberations to choose the project that you will be working on very quickly so you can begin the research on that for the um, analytical research report. Um, so stay healthy. Uh, if you get a chance to get the vaccine, jump at it. Make sure you're vaccinated, wear a mask, stay healthy, uh, protect yourself and others. Okay, and I will talk to you all again real soon.